the spies TV as uh, she maneuvered it to this to the position. Also see the sun glint off the water down there. We're going to show you some still photography a little bit later where we utilize that feature. The first release that I did was a was a simulated backup release, and that went went really smoothly. That was something we were a little concerned about about the drift rates that the arm might give the spas, but the rates were were really low, and uh, we headed right off into the the plume survey. The purpose of the plume data take, as you know, is to fire jets at the spas and uh, use uh, post-landing uh, uh, measurements from the spas to see how much upset there was due to the jets. And we're looking down from the spas now during that phase of operations, firing uh, one of the nose jets up near the black nose uh, and looking for any motion. There was very little detectable motion except during uh, uh, one of the aft maneuvers. Here we're flying up and over the spas in what is known as the inertial approach. We're reorienting the uh, orbiter's axis to align with the uh, proper uh, grapple fixture axis on the spas. We're looking through the uh, COAS there, the optical site, and that was one of our aids in uh, making sure that we're maintaining position on it. We're out at about 200 feet, maintaining that radius as we fly around it. You can see we've passed up and over the spas and uh, almost uh, going around a little bit behind it now. We had purposely maneuvered the spas uh, out of the attitude that it had been in for the entire flight. Uh, and then the, the point of this was to maneuver the orbiter as well to line up its axes with the spas axes. And we'd like to compliment NASA on the orbiter model that they got for us to take these pictures. <laughs> We were told this morning in their management brief that the camera that took those 16 millimeter from the spas was used on Little Joe in the, early in the space program years ago. Not at White Sands. This is the uh, approach and grapple for the, the end of phase two. And you can see slight oscillations in the arm, but it's really, it's really doing just about exactly what I'm commanding it to do. And it, it turned out to be a very easy task and uh, just no problem at all. This is a, actually a still shot that was taken uh, during entry by John, and he did a super job of capturing what it looks like outside the windows. That's the, just about the perfect color of the glow. Uh, we spent most of the time in the, in the darkness during entry. Uh, the vehicle uh, had no surprises. It flew uh, just like we anticipated it would. Uh, our cross range for the entry we flew was a little over 730 miles, nautical miles, which is the max that uh, the shuttle has done thus far. Uh, we did end up uh, deleting some entry maneuvers because of that uh, cross range, been, but the red, we picked up the most important ones. This is showing us coming in over the heading alignment circle. I took manual control uh, just about the time we were overhead Edward. Rick put down the gear at uh, 200 feet, which is where we had planned. And uh, like most uh, way I like to fly when I'm over a lake bed is I like to get down low fairly fast and uh, then just kind of hold it there until it gets ready to get down to the proper airspeed. The touchdown was so light that John and I wanted to call the convoy to find out whether we had touched. Right. I had a pair to say that. <laughs> I got some coming too. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, we, uh, we all had an opportunity to uh, sit back every now and then and relax and look out the window and take pictures. And uh, that was one of the uh, pluses that I was talking about earlier of having five people on board and having a flight plan that's laid out in a reasonable manner. Uh, consequently, uh, I think we all shared equally the work and, uh, and the pleasure. Astronauts Hawk, Fabian, and Thagard, you were referred to in the media sometimes as the near anonymous crew. Do you think that... Uh, out of the glare of the media spotlight, did that help you uh, in your work, just forget it and get up and do your job? Well, a uh, good example of that. My name is pronounced Hout, not Hawk. <laughs> <laughs> and there are certainly some great benefits to being anonymous. Uh, so, uh, no, that, that was, uh, that's not surprising. It's understandable. It's human nature. And uh, none of us joined NASA for the publicity. This was, this was your first time, and 
to us on the ground, it looked like you were really having a good time. But can you give us some words as to what it was like compared to what you thought it was going to be like? And was it really just, my goodness, this is just like the simulator? Is that really what you were thinking when you were up there? Well, I think it's true that you, that you really can't communicate the exhilaration that you feel up there. I can't, but uh, a couple of examples, just the ability to look out the window, look at the earth roll by underneath, to uh, be uh, uh, weightless and to be able to move with a great deal of mobility throughout the cabin. Uh, the sunrises, the sunsets are spectacular. The stars at night are beautiful. Uh, it's just moment after moment you're seeing things that you really never imagined that you could see and it, it, it's just a fantastic experience. Being able to walk on the ceiling was fun. <laughs> Being able to walk on the walls was fun. Um, I agree with Rick that it's it's not at all like the simulator. You know, the, the jobs, the, the PAM, PAM deployments and the RMS operations um, were like the simulator. The simulator trained us very well for those and when we, uh, when we got in our seats and, and uh, had something to do. The simulators trained us very well. But uh, the periods in between those times were not at all like the simulators. You know, the simulators don't give you the great view of the Earth, which is just spectacular. And uh, the sunrises were really, were really something, something special to see. at a press conference just before our flight what I thought about being the first uh, U.S. woman astronaut. I was quoted as saying that it was no big deal. What the astronaut meant to say was that technically, as far as NASA is concerned, it was no big deal. NASA didn't have to do anything different. They didn't alter their flight. They did nothing special for me, and I got all the same training that the guys on our flight got. But I think that uh, on another level, the United States sending a woman into space was a very important event for at least 53% of the population, and I'm very proud of that. When future historians research spaceflight for the year 1983, they will take note that there were five crew members on shuttle mission number seven, Crippen, Hauk, Fabian, Ride, and Thagard. It will be unimportant that one was a woman. And that's the way it should be. Mm -hmm.